Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. This is being filmed on Tuesday, September the 15th in the Memorial Arena in Victoria, BC. I'd like to start by extra thanking the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew for the turmoil I caused at the beginning of this program. Um, the first segment of Citizens Forum is going to be the Medi, Walt and Jack show. And um, Walter, uh, why don't you introduce the first topic? Well, uh, we've always been talking about our concerns about how this election campaign, the federal election campaign is going. And, and we're always wondering uh, exactly who is running these separate campaigns. If in fact they are separate, I've said before that I think they're all part of a, a one program. It appears that they're all being run by the same group. Now, uh, we're trying to understand, for instance, the strategies of the parties and how they're, you know, taking each other on. Sometimes the MVP takes the Liberals on. Sometimes they go after the Conservatives and all that. It's and, all about them. Yeah, and there's, there's lots of weaknesses. In, and curiosities in how they approach their strategies when they're criticizing conservatives in some ways, but for instance, not looking at the overall record of the conservatives the last 10 years. There's lots to drag up there. There's a whole, there's scandals and lots of things that we could be talking about, but instead we're talking about the refugees and some very recent events. But uh, in order to understand strategy and things, and Mehdi has been very good at, at looking at what's happened in the past. How did the NDP and the Liberals and the Conservatives interact before in other elections? And how does that compare with what's happening today? And I think uh, what we could do, and I know Mehdi is, has come here with some information, on looking at how the last by-election was run uh, when uh, Murray Rankin took this seat in Victoria and, 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 and how they employed their strategies. Yes. So Mehdi, um, I know you just gave me this, and, and I, I wish I could read it, and, but, but I'll just, I'm just going to paraphrase from what I understand in this, and that is uh, basically uh, the NDP appear to have uh, kind of scared their constituents and, 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 and people that normally would vote either Green or NDP to vote NDP because they were saying we have to keep the Harperites out of Victoria. And when you look at the numbers and you look at the polling, you realize that perhaps that wasn't the case. So do you want to try to go over that, Mehdi? No, I, I just remember when, when the election was happening, election day was uh, November 26, 2012. And the NDP sent an email out, I think it was either November 22nd or 23rd, by their national director, Mr. Mr. Uh, Nathan Rotman. Yeah. And telling their, their supporters, and I got that, a uh, uh, few other members of the party got that. Yeah. And they're telling them that, uh, here is how he starts his email. Let's, uh, I, I'll be blunt. Stephen Harper could take Victoria, and with just four days to go, we are running out of time to stop him. So he was telling, uh, telling the supporters of NDP, that Stephen Harper is going to take this riding, and this is the race between NDP and Conservative. So don't vote Green. No, don't. Because yes, because there was a lots of leakage of the vote from NDP toward Greens. The Greens were running a very grassroots uh, campaign, and and NDP was really fearful of what's happening on the ground. So instead of telling the truth to their their uh, supporters. They scared their supporters to vote for them in order to stop Stephen Harper. But they knew much be they knew better because there was two uh, poll came, uh, came, one on October 26, that showed that NDP was 47%, uh, percent, Green 20%, Liberal 16, and Conservative 16. Okay, and when on was that? No, uh, October 26. Okay, so the uh, October 26, the NDP were way ahead. Way, way ahead. On November 12, another poll came in, and Conservative were 12, Liberal 14, NDP 40, uh, 47 still, and Green 26. On the election day, the vote was 14% Conservative, 13% Liberal, 37% NDP from 47 to 37 and green 34.3.
So the wow. green were really closing. And this showed that NDP and it still is doing the same thing. Last week, their, their, uh, their uh, candidate in Malahat, uh, Malahat uh, Couchen was, was asked about green uh, 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 competition with NDP because the, uh, the inside poll showed that the greens were 32% and NDP 39%. So when Ian Jessop on CFAX asked him about the greens, he he didn't answer that question. He, he talked about the conservative are coming up, you know, and this, we have to stop. Uh, yeah. uh, and to me, this is a big problem. It's, it's, you know, it's not what the NDP is doing. I mean, I'm a, I'm a member of the NDP. It's disgraceful that you would lie to your own members. But all the parties do it. It's, it's the way the whole thing works. And, and that's what we have to change. I, I haven't seen uh, other parties lie to their own membership. In, in this in this manner, you know, it, this is deception. I was for 24 years member of NDP. This issue caused me to quit because I I couldn't stomach it anymore. You know, you you can't. Well, let me give you a liberal example. When Jean Chrétien was elected, he said he was going to uh, renegotiate NAFTA, and he told his members and everybody else to renegotiate <laughs> NAFTA and uh, get rid of the GST. So, and both of those were complete and totalized. Now they've brought, uh, uh, they've brought Mr. Cretien out, I guess, to remind us that everything Justin Trudeau says is probably a lie, too. Yes, but, but it, we always thought, uh, you know, thought the NDP is different. We are, we, we yeah, are a right. grassroots, yeah, yeah, progress, yeah. It's supposedly so disappointing. progressive party, and, and that wasn't the case. You want to talk about the, the debates? Well, I just want to add to this. I mean, uh, and, and it's, it's hard to do uh, research, by the way, when you're trying to dig up dirt, real good dirt on parties and, and trying to figure out how they're doing things. And we love to do that. But uh, one thing that I did find out is that we have the same public relations firms running all three parties' campaigns. So when you see this script that they're, they're following, especially with the NDP liberal jostling back and forth and criticism back and forth and you hear this like if you were listening to Sunday morning CBC yesterday morning there's some interviews and there's a lot of squabbling and you think why they must know that this is not for the best for their party in the end that this is just going to narrow the gap for the conservatives but they keep on doing it because I think it's exactly what they're being set up for is this narrow conservative victory as the NDP and the Liberals squabble. We'll see on October the 20th what the plan is. But this does lead in well to the conversation about the upcoming debate. Yes. And uh, how is that being set up? Who's, who's running that debate? And, and why is Elizabeth May not being allowed to? As you know, they were debating, they, they were negotiating in May about the three part, four parties about the debates and even then in may uh, altia raj of huffington post you wrote a wrote a very revealing article he he she, she was talking to an insider but she doesn't say from which of the parties and this is the code i'm reading thursday de uh, thursday debate wrangling confirmed to some that ndp and conservative have been working together for months to box in the liberals and freeze the green out of the debate. In quote, in my view, there is an attempt to get the liberals off the opposition map and the NDP doesn't want the greens there. One person involved with the negotiation said, two parties who are supposedly dramatically opposed are working together. And, and when we see, for example, in this, uh, uh, when the debate start happening, Mr. Harper refused to participate in consortium uh, debate. Yeah. Mr. Malker follow. Mr. Harper wanted to have the debate with the, uh, the, the monk and, and uh, Globe and Mail and, and, and actually this uh, privately sponsored debate, Mr. Malker follow. So when, when there was the debate for woman, on women issue, Mr. Harper refused to participate. Mr. Malker followed. So this, this is the game they have been playing in the last three elections. If the fake left and the right agree on, on issues, you can edge <clears throat> out and push out the liberals from the middle out 
out of the debate, out of the, uh, the picture, and say that the, the, the fight is between us and uh, between NDP and the liberals. And they have done that. If you, if you remember, there was a lots of article was written about, uh, ab ab about uh, the, this is an election between NDP and conservative. Here is one, the, the headlines. It is orange versus blue. David Aiken, uh, Ottawa's son. Another one. Move over May and Trudeau. BC is ND NDP conservative battleground. This was on tie by Bill Tillman. Or, or this is from uh, Margaret Venti, Globe and May. With liberals squeezed out, a new two-way race. This is how they wanted this race, this election, be between NDP, the fake left, and the right. And if they achieve that, by the last week of the election, then people are going to look at these two and say, which one really we want? We want a guy that say, balanced budget is a virtue, like Mr. Harper, or a guy uh, that from the left that claim balanced budget is a virtue, which is more fair. <laughs> they go toward the, the conservative, and that's what's happened in 2011 election and give a majority to conservative. Mm -hmm. That's why when you talk about who is, who is controlling these elections, who is, who is managing this election, we see Mr. Brad Levine of Hill and Norton coming back to help NDP, and Hill and Norton also have a lots of people helping the conservatives, and who is paying the bills? Corporations. The big corporations are paying Hill and Norton to do these type of of uh, yes, and the, and the big corporations, I think, run all three parties. They are running the three parties, and they're running the election, and they're running the debate. Yes, and that's why, for example, if you remember how they got rid of Paul Martin, there was one issue, and that was the the scandal, the the sponsorship, the sponsorship scandal. scandal, which was about maybe thirty, forty million dollar at most, but even not that much at most. But in the last three elections. Both NDP and Conservative are not talking about the, 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 the Mr. Mr. Harper, uh, what he has done, his record in last 10 years, devastating mm -hmm. the social fabric of the country, and nobody talk about it. That's true. That, that's, like, maybe that's the most fundamental point. Nobody is talking about the homeless roaming our street, the fact that people have to wait months and years for operations. With, uh, af I mean, the whole medical system is run by the corporations. The whole country, it, it's... I'll just put a little bit of good news in Thank while you. we're talking, because in, the, in these upcoming debates, with, which Elizabeth May has uh, been excluded, uh, she's going to be going live on Twitter, when this will be shown after the, after the debates. But still, I think uh, this type of media with Twitter and things of that nature are, are things that are outside of the, not as much under the control of these corporate masters. And I think the Greens are going to, are using this tech, this technology uh, in a more clever fashion than the other parties. So Elizabeth May is going to be commenting on Twitter while a debate is going on. She, she, is, she is doing everything in order to give people another options. The corporations are deciding, you know, with this, with this uh, Globe and Mail uh, and also the TVA and, and Monk, we allow the private sponsorship to decide who the people of Canada should hear. Exactly. And, and this, is, this is totally unacceptable for a democratic society. Yeah. And, and Elizabeth may rightfully say, I'm going to do every, any, everything that I can do to get my voice heard by the people. And I just want to mention the Globe and Mail is owned by the Thompson family, Canada's richest family. So here we have Canada's richest family telling the people of Canada who we can hear and see in our election debate. I mean, how's that for the state of our democracy? In 2008, Elizabeth May was participated because of the people pressure, and we saw Harper couldn't get his majority. You know, in 2011, they pushed her out, and Harper got majority. Harper knows if Elizabeth May is there, Harper and Malker cannot gang up on Trudeau. And this is the whole thing, to gang up on Trudeau, 
the, the fake left and the right, and, 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 and win, it, win the debate. This is what they can do. But if Elizabeth May is there, they cannot do that. But it doesn't matter who gets elected? It, it is very important because we are not electing Mr. Harper. In every different constituency, we elect a representative yeah. of a party. It is important if we want a better parliament next time to have, for example, 10, 12 Greens. Yes, I Because agree. the Greens are the only party. Yeah. You know, I am not looking at any other issue except Greens are the only party that, the, that their candidate agreed to see, to participate in accountability meeting on a regular basis with their constituents. If they do that, nine meeting a month, a, a, a year, in nine different months, then they are always are in contact with people. They cannot lie to us. They cannot ignore the problems. Because if they ignore it this month, next month they have to face us again. So this is, this is to reduce the democratic deficit that we have in this country. And Green Party is agreeing to do that. The, another thing is that Elizabeth May, among all the political leaders, is the only one that say, yes, the ends, uh, you know, reaching an ends is important, but the means matter. She is not trampling over her values to reach an ends. Betty, is she the only one who voted against the bombing of Libya? She was the only one that voted against the extension of the, of the, of the no-fly zone, right. which was really the bombing of the Libya. Because they, they, they voted in April of 2013, 2011, the first three months. And when they uh, supposedly to have a safe f f f fly zone, so, so people are not being, being bombed. But then they continue bombing the Libyans. And Elizabeth May opposed that in the second vote. The only one who opposed the destruction of a Canadian general led the bombing of Libya. That leads directly to Syria. It led directly to ISIS. Elizabeth May voted against that. It's a disgrace that she's not in the uh, debate. And she, the Greens aren't being covered by the media at all. Thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome to segment two of Citizens Forum being filmed on Tuesday, September the 15th. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and Shaw staff. Um, I'd like to begin this segment with an apology because of something I said in last week's show. Uh, I criticized two groups that had organized an all-candidates all candidates debate. Um, it was um, uh, the BCSEA, Sustainable Energy Association, and the Dogwood Initiative, and I criticized them for not inviting one of the candidates. Somebody pointed out to me that because that other candidate's paperwork was not officially completed, uh, and it, it, it wasn't at that time, then they really aren't a candidate, and in fact, almost by law, I believe, cannot participate in, in, in candidate debates. Can't have an office, uh, can't, can't call yourself a candidate until the paperwork with Elections Can is done. So uh, that was completely my mistake, and again, I want to apologize to both the Dogwood Initiative and um, BCSEA, who were doing something good and uh, got hammered for it. So. Um, Walter, we're going to start off with 9-11. Uh, this, is, this is kind of the week of 9-11. Um, and what I heard in the media was the usual BS, as if there were no questions that could ever be asked about 9-11, as if the official story was completely true, as if... I mean, it, there are so many questions and obvious contradictions in the official 9-11 story, the fact that the media in both Canada and the United States will never say it shows just how completely corrupt these two countries are. And, it's a dis and that has led directly to the creation of ISIS, to Bill C-51, now to the refugee crisis, and who knows where the nations have been destroyed, Syria, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, four nations destroyed with the full support of our 
corrupt leadership, our corporate media, the corporations that run this country. If we don't have a revolution in this country and get rid of the lunatics who run us, then they're going to, I mean, they're going to do it to us too. We are literally fighting for our lives against these people. We've got to get rid of them and replace them with democratic governments. And I just don't know what else to say. Well, there's so much to say about 9-11 because it has shaped this whole era, uh, the way governments operate. Uh, the Harper regime has put one repressive law after another, Bill C-51, which is a very, very serious type of... Bill C-24, which is even worse and which yeah. nobody knows about. But all these bills, and they're all an attack on human rights and civil rights and privacy. And us, all of us. All, uh, attack on, on our legitimacy as citizens. Um, I mean, that in itself is a huge concern. But, you know, the people that know that this is all, you know, the official story, well, firstly, it was so ham-fisted. It was, <laughs> you know, it was almost like they wanted the people that were thinking to rise up and criticize and then get totally disenfranchised because our voices were never heard, was never considered. Uh, even though the facts are so, you just stand at, on their own. And uh, here's a couple. First of all, there's no evidence ever. There's no evidence ever of an airplane hitting the Pentagon. There's tremendous evidence that all three buildings that fell on, on that day in, in, in September of 2001, that all three buildings were brought down by explosives. And the media and the politicians will not talk about it. And I saw something yesterday. Literally tens of thousands of Americans got, have gotten sick and or died because they were the suckers who were sent in to clean up the mess when the people who were behind it all knew that those people were, would be dead. They were murdering those people, just as they murdered the firemen and the policemen who died on that day and everybody who was in the buildings. It was deliberate corporate government murder. And it's, if we can't get rid of those people, they are going to kill us all. No doubt. I mean, uh, we have to face a few things. I mean, whatever you want to call this world, global financial system, if you want to call it international capitalism or, you know, whatever, this, whatever it is, uh, it's been a huge success for the rich. And it's been devastating for the, for the rest of us. And it's been a catastrophe for, our, for, the, for the planet and for our environment with irreparable damage and all that. And we do have to change that. And uh, if some people think that that sounds like socialism or, or communism or something, it doesn't matter because we have to get these reins uh, back into our, the hands of democracy and out of the hands of these people. That's it. It's that democracy. It doesn't have to be social and co it has to be democracy. Yeah. So we get what we want. We have no democracy left in this country. This election is a complete sham as far as I'm concerned, although I am going to vote. I am going to vote. I'm going to vote green. In, in this, I haven't voted for yeah. years, and I don't have that much faith in the Green Party. But I want to try to throw a bit of a monkey wrench, and and hopefully the Greens hopefully will change the system. That's all we have to do. We have to change the rules and laws that govern our democracy, so that it becomes again a democracy. And I think maybe Elizabeth May is into that. I hope. No, no doubt. But I'm, I'm, always, I'm always preoccupied with that psychological operation that 9/11 was that dichotomy from reality to this official story when it was so bizarre and so outlandish and so unbelievable but it didn't seem to matter as a matter of fact the more outlandish it was the better for them because they could stuff it down our throats they could stuff it down every progressive person's in this in this in the world stuff it down their throats and say we know you guys know we're lying but you can't do anything about it. That's exactly and we're going to rob your power. And I think people should just say, okay, you guys, that's round one. You, they won. They won that. And we're suffering the ramifications. But we're not down on the mat for good. We can rise up. We can get ahead. We can elect progressive candidates in this election. 
And you know, and this is one good reason to vote for the for the Greens in this upcoming election. I give you hundreds of reasons, but this is one because we can now bring back a little bit of democracy back into our lives, and I, that's probably the most important thing. Um, we're going to move on to uh, more local issues, but it's it's kind of the same thing, just on a smaller scale. There's yeah. no real difference. Um, so, where did you want to start? Well, um, something that just came to mind is, and it, it, I always talk about John Ralston Saul, and I always think if you read some of the things John Ralston Saul has written about uh, capitalism and about uh, what he calls corporatism and how, why the system is constipated, why nothing can move, we can never get ahead here, Jack. And the, and the, and the sewage treatment <laughs> plan, <laughs> unfortunately, or maybe well enough, is a good example. Uh, but the thing is with the CRD, the CRD is a thing that has us bunged up here, Jack. The CRD is a bureaucracy that's untouchable, that uh, the CRD, uh, people that go to the CRD are unelected, and the staff at the CRD are basically just nowhere to be found. The decisions to push ahead with uh, the design that they want is basically, as we're finding out, just basically, it's a monster that we can't kill. And, I, and John Wilson Saul does write about the bureaucracy and how it's an, such an important part of this international corporate agenda that we have to get into these bureaucracies and get rid of these people. And, and by I, the I way, think what we're talking about is really the people at the very top who make the decisions. Because within the bureaucracy, there's lots of people who, who just want to do their job and do the right thing. But if they do the right thing, they get fired. Well, whoever else is running the show. A couple of things I'm just going to bring up. Uh, of course, this is an older headline. Uh, it's about uh, C. Terra, the, uh, the boss of C. Terra was uh, finally let go and with a little $500,000 going away present. Uh, and before, <laughs> before uh, Albert Sweetham left, he had, I think he had decided, and we, we'll have to check this more further, but he had let out three contracts to look at uh, different designs for sewage treatment plants, but they were all one big sewage treatment plant of one sort or other. So there was another $750,000. Right, now that's been in the news this week because at some point in time somebody made a decision, even though they yeah. knew that the McLaughlin Point uh, plant was not going ahead, they still put out three contracts for $250,000 each for somebody to do a study on, on how to build that plant that wasn't yeah. going to go. And now it's come out in the news this week and everybody thinks, oh, that's just standard operating procedure. Yes, you know, ba 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 ba. That was a million dollars down the drain. And somebody has to be held accountable. I don't know who made the decision, but whoever did make the decision, the fact that our politicians yeah. will not in any way hold them accountable and just say, oh, yeah, another million dollars. And it's a disaster for this city, and it seems like we're back on track, very possibly, for still one or possibly two secondary treatment plants being built, and somebody, uh, they want the money. They want to do the least amount of work to get the most amount of money, and that's where we're being led, I fear. I mean, I don't know, but that's from... And we've been following it a bit. That seems to be where we're going. Well, it's hard. It's hard to really figure it out, as you know. Where are they going with this? Nobody seems to want to answer that plain old question. Are we talking about a distributed system and uh, a tertiary type of uh, system? I uh, don't seem to hear much about it, but we do hear a lot about this east side, west side committees, and and they're still talking about these massive treatment plants, which. Who wants that? Nobody wants it, Jack. We already know it's a bad idea. And that is the strange thing about it. Uh, there's nobody that's going to step up. This is the deal, Jack. If you had elected CRD or elected representatives that you could go to, that they could say, okay, look, this is what we want. The public has spoken. 
We want this type of treatment system. Let's move ahead. But we haven't ever had that. We've never had a referendum or a plebiscite on it, nothing like that. We're just going to go ahead and spend maybe a billion dollars by now on something we may never need. And it's, it's a ship without a captain, as far as I can tell, because there's nobody really steering this thing. Well, I, I, f I think somebody is steering it. You know, it is being steered. Yeah. It's been steered from the beginning to give a small group of people who run this city exactly what they want. Yeah. The rest of us are, are out of the picture completely. You wanted to talk a bit about amalgamation. We've only got a couple of minutes. Well, left. it kind of does have a relationship to, to the whole thing. I think it does. Uh, I got another headline. I should tell you the date of this. Friday, July 31st, but nevertheless, uh, we have Peter Fassbender, uh, the ex-Minister uh, of Education now taking over and now going to be uh, looking into this issue around amalgamation. Now, boy, we take a lot of comfort in that, that Peter Fassbender is going to be talking about this and the province is going to be talking about this. Would you go to the province and ask the, the Clark government for advice on anything? I wouldn't because we know for sure that they are fully 100% in the pockets of the corporations. Amalgamation usually works well to make some people money, but it doesn't work well for the rest of the populations, and we've seen that time and time again. Amalgamation is usually a bad idea for expenditures, usually taxes uh, skyrocket and services go down, and we have uh, more, uh, more population and less representatives, and we have uh, large interest groups having more influence. Yeah, yeah. And here we have the Liberal government going to be advising us on that. And, and nobody I, is more behind it than CFAX Radio right here in the city. That's right. Owned by Bell Media. Uh, I mean, they certainly don't work for the interests of the people of this city. I, I just want to finish with yeah. a bit about climate change. The huge fires that are burning in California right now, literally thousands of people out of their homes there. It, it's cars, folks. We've got to face the fact that the age of the car has got to be over and the age of overconsumption has got to be over. We all have to move back to a much, much, much simpler life if we want to avoid complete and total devastation and catastrophe. Um, so let's start moving in that direction. And here we have an election and nobody will even say the word climate change. Walter, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Jack. And thank you for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes this program happen every week. Our guest in this segment is Rhiannon Snaith. Uh, Rhiannon is with a group called Vote Ready. Um, and she just pointed out that today, uh, when we're filming this, September the 15th, is the United Nations Day of Democracy. And Vote Ready is a group that holds workshops and events about learning together for a stronger democracy. And I can't think of too many things that are more important. So thank you for doing it, Rhiannon. And w maybe you can just tell us what Vote Ready does, what happens at these workshops. Yeah, well, absolutely. We, we do throughout the months preceding an election, and we hope to continue even beyond the election for other elections in the future. Exactly what we celebrate on Democracy Day, which is encouraging and promoting conversation and engagement with democracy and informed citizenship and active citizenship. So we run different workshops and events to get people more enthusiastic and more informed and ready for voting. You mentioned here um, a democratic deficit. I agree that there's certainly a democratic de deficit. How does this democratic deficit affect everyday people? Is that something you talk about in the workshops? Well, it's something that we try to take head on, actually. The democratic deficit is, is a sort of a key word that's been used for more than a decade to describe the level of citizen participation in Canada, not just in elections, but in the political process in general. In our democracy. In our democracy. Yeah. We have a democracy in which <laughs> citizens are not allowed to participate. How's that for a democracy? Yeah, or choose not to participate for various reasons, uh, which is, you know, the disengagement from f survey feedback that Statistics Canada has done. People feel disengaged because 
they feel like politics doesn't represent them. They often just don't understand how it all works and they're confused about how to vote. Lots of reasons that we try and tackle head on in our workshops by creating curriculums that respond to those questions that have come out of research and also to get people talking amongst each other to realize that within themselves and within their communities there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of passion and a lot of desire for change that can be harnessed. Yeah, there sure is. And, and I think people want democracy. I think people really want some democracy, but in this country um, today, there doesn't seem to be a lot of it going around. So if, if I came to one of the workshops, um, what, would, what would we talk about? What's the format? And well, the workshops that we're focusing on right now in the run-up to the election, one is called Getting Your Bearings, and that's about exploring the political spectrum, breaking down a little bit concepts of left and right, and looking at all the different factors that influence our political opinions, and looking at these politics in a holistic way, and trying to find your own place in that spectrum. It's very active, so we play games and we talk with each other and we move around the room. There is a slideshow in the background, but most of what we're doing is dialogue. The people who facilitate the courses, which generally is myself and my partner Alvaro Moreno, and we don't come in as authorities, we come in as facilitators to get the community talking and discovering together. So, a voter advice application that you may have heard of. It's something gaining in popularity around the world. Uh, we have one in Canada called Vote Compass and it puts you through a series of questions that in the end plots you on an XY axis, gives you a space on a grid and then also plots political parties on the same grid and you can see your proximity oh, to right. these different I have seen things. It. So you answer a bunch of questions and it says you're probably a supporter of the X party. Yeah, you're able yeah. to see on an XY axis, on a, on a grid, where you might be closest to. Yeah. Well, when I filled it out, it was a couple of years ago, I was happy with the answer. It was where I thought I would be, yeah. Yes. Well, I think it's a very interesting tool, and they are popular worldwide. And Vote Compass, and in partnership with the CBC, has run it for several years now, and to some acclaim and to some criticism. Yeah. I believe that there is great utility in it, but I also want to go a little bit further and have people engage with the questions more, not just type yes or no into a computer and get an answer, but understand why they end up where they end up on the grid. So in the Getting Your Bearings workshop, that's what we do. We look as a group on these different axes and we find our position. And then that helps us in our research to go out and look at where the parties lie. Do you guys, uh, do you guys talk about um, um, e voting reform at all? Is that something that you go into? We do have another workshop called Government Electoral Systems. Now, when everything we do gets trialed and we receive evaluative feedback from the participants. And what we realized with that is that there's so much desire for the information that we're going to split it into two workshops. So we'll have one on government systems and we'll have one on elections. There is a big desire to talk about proportional representation in there, absolutely. So, I mean, to me, anything that is starting to get people talking about democracy is doing something great. So I hope that, um, that people will be coming, you know, come out to the workshops and, and um, so, for example, let's say the issue of, let me pick an issue, genetic, <clears throat> genetically, what I call genetically contaminated foods. I think 80% of Canadians, I, I keep hearing, maybe the number's wrong, want them at least to be labeled, at least to be labeled, and yet it doesn't matter, right? So how do we deal with that problem with our democracy where our governments don't seem to care what, what we want? Right. Well, that's a... That's a big question. It's a big question, and it goes a little bit beyond voting, and that's... Oh, yeah. ...absolutely something that is at the core of Vote Ready's principles, is that we're not just encouraging voting. We're encouraging active citizenship, and that is an ongoing thing uh, that, that happens with community and as individuals, with our MPs, with other community groups. 
and in all kinds of ways being active to inform the government of what we think and to build strength as a community to, to drive those impressions home and perhaps change legislation. Um, the people who come to the workshops, um, you said you get feedback from them. Yeah. So, I mean, do people feel they're learning about democracy or helping build democracy or blah, blah, blah? Well, it depends which workshop exactly that they come to. Uh, we do have the Getting Your Bearings, which I was talking a bit about how we, how we uh, do activities and that. We also look at theories of representation in our candidates and campaigns workshop, and the government electoral systems, and other forms of citizen engagement in Beyond Voting. So the outcome is always going to depend on the content. But generally what we hear is that people feel inspired, they enjoy talking with their peers, they enjoy voicing their own opinions. It's a form that they don't encounter very often. You know, part of our democratic deficit is that people don't even talk to each other about politics. It's sort of just a non-topic. So this provides a venue for that to happen. And often people realize they have more knowledge than they thought they did, or they learn new knowledge from their peers or from our presentations. And they tend to be motivated by it. We get a lot of people who say they will vote, even if they haven't before, or that they're inspired to be active citizens, do things like petition, join groups, and remain politically active. Yeah, and all of that is important, but boy, we're kind of in late innings here, as, you know, as far as the planet goes, for example, and I think a lot of people know that, and you know, we want to save ourselves, and, and yet our governments um, you know, I mean, it really is democracy that, that we need, I think, and I, I'm, I think the, the area of citizen participation and kind of demanding some democracy is, is what we have to do, because if we don't very quickly, I don't know where we're going. <laughs> Yeah, I do agree, and so I think that initiatives like Vote Ready, and yes, not just yes. ours, but any initiative that engages the public, we've been very lucky to be endorsed by the Council of Canadians, which is Canada's largest citizen group. Yeah, they right, do yeah. incredible work across the country uh, on all kinds of issues, and campaigning and education, and programs like, like this program, where we are providing a forum. So, is have you got... Um you do have some events coming up in October, yes? Yes, Can we do, yeah. On so October 6th, we'll be at the Greater Victoria Public Library, another one of our endorsers. They've been very generous with yeah, their support cool. and space. So we'll be at the downtown branch uh, doing candidates and campaigns. And then again on October 7th, we'll be at the Wanda Fuca branch of the Greater Victoria Public Library doing that same workshop. And people can go to the website, voteready.ca? Yes, at voteready.ca, all our events are listed. We also have some community cafe, which is an opportunity for conversation, and sometimes with a special guest. We also have pop-up kiosks, which go through voter ID requirements, how to register, questions about the election, and a practice vote where you can actually cast a ballot if you've never done that before. Yeah, I guess there are people who've never done that. Yeah, and they say, how? Oh, it's so easy. <laughs> About one minute left, and we've got some pictures, so maybe for the last minute we can just show some of the pictures. Would that be okay? Great, yeah, okay. pictures of, of how we do the community education, working together for a better democracy. Uh, Rhiannon and Snape, thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum, and enjoy the pictures.
Welcome back. Our guest in the last segment of Citizens Forum is Will Smith, and we're going to be talking about consciousness. Will, thank you very much. Yes, today, well, I, I thought of, uh, you know, the, the things that are going on in the, uh, in the elections, both here and in the United States, are just getting to be so silly. So I thought I'd, I'd just kind of start off by making a preposterous assertion, at least it's going to sound like it's a preposterous, that we already live in a full-time perpetual direct democracy, but we just don't know how to use it. And so my... Uh, you're right, that is preposterous. <laughs> it sounds preposterous, but I'm going to try to convince you in this show and over the course of uh, the, whenever I show up or if I get my own show that Reality 2.0 is almost here and that it's got a lot of really interesting things and it's even more profound than going from a world that was flat to a world that was a sphere. And you'll notice that this is the same kind of transition of consciousness that we're going from a flat world to a round world. Notice that nothing really changed. The earth didn't suddenly become round and it had been flat all of a sudden. But what really happened was just our consciousness changed. So in the past two weeks, I've participated in a, uh, in a change of consciousness for myself, which is I just got this random email from a website called academia.edu. And it was from uh, Jack Safarti, who is the, uh, he had just put up a paper on this website. He's the guy who is the, 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 the professor in Back to the Future. Remember that? I remember the movie. I did remember the crazy it? professor, yeah. Did you see all three of them or did no, you just see? I stopped after the first one. <laughs> so anyway, so, so he's very interested in time travel. And so he put up this paper that, uh, and started a discussion that said, is our universe a, uh, a computer simulation, a, a holographic computer simulation? And this, he, he uh, labeled this a teleological problem. Now, teleology is the, stu is the study of why something is. In other words, this, this discussion assumes that there's some reason why the universe is the way it is. It didn't just randomly happen. And I think this is really interesting for all of us in this discussion of consciousness because it just shows us that we're not, we're not used to dealing with things at this level. I mean, for scientists to talk about why something is so rather than just how it is, that's an interesting shift, isn't it? Because a scientist is usually looking at just facts. So there has I to be, guess, yeah. so teleology implies that there's some intention, there's some reason why the universe should exist like this. So anyway, I'm, I don't uh, claim to understand the equations behind quantum physics, but I just get the, the big picture here. The things I take away from it are a little, might be considered a little bit odd. The first one is that we're all unconscious because we've been, we have this incredible power to influence things at the subatomic level, but we were seemingly not able to do that. So what and does that mean, to influence things at the subatomic level? It means we should be able to just create, uh, we should just be able to walk around and, and change reality because our reality is created. But, and these are what, this is what the, uh, the Russian scientists that I'm reading, uh, Grigory Grabovoy and uh, Arkady Petrov, that's what they're saying is that we just, we don't understand the world around us. What's really so is that the world is created by us real time, that we, our consciousness, creates reality and not just us but any other sentient being so the image I, I like to think of the image that they're portraying as kind of like the sun so there's a there's a you can call it God or you can call it an energy source or love or whatever it is it's this energy that that uh, so, some kind of energy that runs the entire universe and that becomes matter so in other words our matter is created out of energy and uh, so the, the image that, that I like to think of that is, is that we're like raindrops making a rainbow. So we're falling down through the sky. Whether we are cognizant, whether we're conscious of the rainbow being there or not, it gets formed. And so the rainbow is formed by virtue of the sun shining through us and then forming the rainbow. And what it's saying is we have, we have different levels of consciousness. So one conscious level of consciousness might be that we don't know that we're creating a rainbow, which is kind of where we are. We don't know that we're creating all this stuff. We just laugh at quantum physicists who try to tell us that, or magicians. But the next one is we say, gee, oh look, I'm making a rainbow. The drop could say I'm making a rainbow. But then the next step is the, maybe the drop could shift its shape. 
and so the rainbow, all the drops together could shift the shape and the rainbow could look differently, or all the drops could start humming and the, the, uh, the vibrations of the, of the drops would make a pattern, a shimmering pattern in the rainbow. And I, I mean, that, that to me is a pretty good image of, of what's happening because it allows us to have different levels of, of consciousness. So are you saying that, for example, we think we have a huge problem with climate change, but I think what you're saying is that if we can shift our consciousness, we can get rid of that problem. It won't That's exist exactly anymore. what I'm saying. And well, I hope you're right. And, and, and it, what I'm saying also, and I've, I've said this in past shows, is that this is the only way that humans make any progress, is that we, get, we have to get pushed into the corner, just like in the movies, just like in the myths. We have to get pushed into the corner, and oh my gosh, there's no way out. And then we find out, oh, we just jump up to the next level. And what I'm saying is the next level is that we're, we're, we're losing our inability to affect reality directly. We're, no, we're going to get to the point where we don't have to push atoms around so much, but we just, we use what's called controlled clairvoyance. And, the, and so, so that leads to, do we have uh, enough time for another two minutes or something, do you think? Or? I have no idea where our time is. Okay, so, so the, the, uh, one of the things that we talk about in this, in this show a lot is, uh, is what is, rea what is this uh, reality, the, what do we call it, uh, consensus reality, oh, right, the right, reality right. that everybody agrees on. Okay, right. okay, so that's not the only reality that exists. What, what, there's a reality for each person. There's a, there's a reality that each person is, is moving around in, and we don't have any good words for how that works exactly, but but we can, we can talk about concepts at least. So, so this consensus reality can be, instead of uh, being in, uh, involved in consensus reality, we can, uh, in reality 2.0, we have something which I like to call discrete reality, which is your reality is what you sense and what you see, and my reality is what I sense and what I see. And we've been dumbed down to where we can't really, I mean, if a kid sees something, like if you're, if you're walking around with your child and he says, Dad, I just saw a gnome over there. You say, you don't say, oh, really? What, what was he wearing? You say, you didn't see a gnome. That's what you say to your kid. And so pretty soon, they don't see gnomes anymore. They don't see whatever it is that they're seeing. And uh, there are some things about this in movies, like there was a thing. And the in, school system probably yeah, the has a lot of that. Yeah, the school system does that. Yeah. So we don't encourage this. But, but in fact, it exists. So I'm going to bring up two different examples of discrete reality. And the first one is just if you're a, because our society is a, Primarily, uh, the basis of it is Christian, based on. So, so most people know the, st the Bible story where um, one of the disciples, I think it was Peter, came up to Jesus and said, "Hey, we got to pay taxes. What are we going to do?" And Jesus said, "Well, you don't really have to pay taxes. I mean, it's not really what you have to do. But if you really want to pay him, so just to avoid trouble, uh, just catch a fish, and there'll be a coin in his mouth, and it's enough to pay your taxes." So the question is, I mean, if you read that, and I mean, I don't even know, I know I've read it before, but I didn't, it didn't really enter my mind what's going on here. But the idea of the Russian scientists is that this is, everybody has a real, as these discrete realities that they can be aware of. And so in this case, Jesus was aware that there was a fish there. He could somehow with clairvoyance see that there's a fish there. And so he just said, go do this. And, I, and because that might sound outlandish to people, I found another one. A friend of mine came over and said, hey, remember that old song, the Harper Valley PTA? And it's about, uh, it's from the 60s, I think, or maybe the 70s. And it's about this uh, little girl who comes home and she's got a note from the Harper Valley PTA. And they're saying, you know, that she's, her mother is immoral and she shouldn't be bringing up her little girl. And so... The mother goes to the PTA and uh, just lays into him and says, hey, you, you've asked me for a date three times. You're drunk all the time. You come in with a hangover, all this stuff. These people are, this, these Harper people are just immoral and liars and everything. And so this, this friend of mine wanted to make a, a parody of the song. I don't know what for exactly, but anyway, so I started reading about the song. It was a really interesting thing. This woman who sang the song, she was unknown. It was a one-hit wonder. And uh, the, the producer heard her sing another song that he didn't really particularly care for, but he had a song in his back pocket, which was this Harper Valley PTA song. And he just knew with her voice and that song and everything that was going on in the United States about the hypocrisy and everything that was going on, 
that it would be a hit. And he said, I'll give you a million dollar song if you can get that woman to sing it. And so she it sang it. It happened. And they threw in something from laughing. That's the day my mama socked it to the Harper Valley PTA. You know, it's a yeah. really a, an effective song. And uh, so this guy was tuned in to this reality that this would be a million dollar song. So that's what I'm talking about. Nobody else knew about that. Nobody else thought, could see that. Nobody else could sense that that was so, but he knew. So that's what we're looking at is this, is encouraging that in ourselves that, that uh, we have these innate capabilities and, and getting them out to where, as the Russian guys say, there's this point where you have to get over the, uh, the hump or the threshold of being able to influence reality. If you're just watching, it's one thing, but if you're actively seeing, then it's something else and you can change. Well, what, can, uh, what can we do to influence some reality here in a positive direction, is there? Can well, we actually... it's what we're doing, we're doing the right things. We're finding out the way the world really works instead of pretending that we can't see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these are, these are really important things. I mean, we can't just uh, let our leaders tell us what's true. We can't let our leaders, we can't have our leaders show us something on TV and say, this is what's so, because it's not. Yeah. You know, what I've found is being able to go into a space that is still at least a little bit natural, away from the corpo, techno, car-based, lunatic society we all have to live in, and just stepping back into the world of nature, even for a few minutes, and just see the speed at which nature works and the beauty of nature and, and, and the, every part of it. That's exactly right. That's, I mean, met, you're saying, really, you're saying a, some type of meditation. It's an altered state of consciousness where you're quiet and things aren't, your brain isn't going, oh my God, what are we going to do about this? Yeah, so that's a big, that is a really big part of it right there. And that's where we're going to have to leave it. Will, All right. thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you for Enjoy watching this. Citizens Forum this week.